need to talk to them. Barbara, and I'm not, 
I can't pronounce the disease. She had a very rare disease a few years ago, and she had a stem cell transplant okay. at uh, Vanderbilt, and uh, there's now worry that it, there's a recurrence. Okay. And so she's going to Vanderbilt Tuesday. I have to ask you that information again later. Yes. Oh, um, many of you might remember that uh, I lost a friend, uh, like sibling, last year at this time, and now her sister is um, in kidney failure. And will uh, hospice is coming tomorrow in Johnson City. Her name is Debbie Holden. Uh, very much, uh, very very close to me. I would appreciate your prayers, and she would too. She is a strong woman of faith, but things are getting beyond uh, too many more miracles. Thank you. Yes, I have a joy. Yes. I can't remember a time when I was so excited to come to church than I was today. And it's because of you, Jennifer and the beautiful music, and the congregation. The Sunday school class, it's, it was a good feeling. And I haven't had it for a while. And I want to thank you. God, we lift up all those we have named this morning, those we have been praying for this week, as well as those we may have not shared out loud but carry in our hearts. We have many in our community dealing with loss, illness, and surgeries. We ask for you to surround them with your presence and healing mercies. God of peace and justice, we feel overwhelmed by the reports of war and mass shootings. Help us to not become numb, but to continue to bring your justice into the world. Lord, for those who live in fear for tomorrow, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who are seeking shelter, we pray that your spirit of comfort would draw near. On this Pentecost Sunday, breathe in us anew. Fill us with new purpose and strength for the journey. May we all find our hope and hope in you. God, help us to now set aside our worries and our fears so that we can be present with you in this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us turn our hearts to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call of worship. How manifold are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. And so you leave the face of the earth. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I am. us in breath, visit us from the throne of heaven, and set us aflame with amazement and joy, and open our paths to new visions, and guide our feet deeper into your wisdom. Give us faith to trust your presence. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Centering moment is a house united. See you. 
I have a video about change for children that I wanted to share with you. Reverend Assistant Grace Close, Associate Director of Connectional Ministries for Discipleship here in the Holston Conference. We are delighted to talk to you about Change for Children. This is a program and ministry that has been, uh, we have at least figured out it's at least 18 years old or older. But it uh, was started and is administered by the Holston Conference Children's Ministry team. We received grants both in February and August of each year. The offerings are collected at annual conference. This ministry actually began with children collecting the change of, uh, from congregants each Sunday. And then they would hold these change collections and uh, bring to annual conference. Many of churches still can <clears throat> take up every Sunday and pass the offering plate, collecting the change. I have been in churches where you can hear the clink of the change hitting the offering plate. Other churches choose to collect it in other ways, and that is fine. But each year at annual conference, we still receive the collections that churches bring in for change for children. These ministries have been provided, as I said, over the last 18 years or longer. And currently, we offer three grants, three types of grants. The first are directly to local churches. Churches that submit by February and August of each year a grant application, which is found on our conference website. But these programs have varied recently from Wednesday night programming for children and families to backpack ministries, to diaper ministries, to even a traveling library in the Three Rivers District. And we're always looking for ways that churches are providing and developing and building relationships with children and families in their congregation, in their communities, not only just providing tangible items to, pam uh, to families. Second type of grant that we pr provide are for training. Many churches have local uh, children's directors, volunteers in children's ministry who may or may not have resources or training to lead effectively. And there are a number of training opportunities that are offered throughout the year. And we provide grants for persons to take advantage of those training opportunities. A third type of gift and grant that we award are international grants. Many of the grants that we awarded initially were for uh, Grace Home in Uganda and Sudan. Uh, that has even been expanded to offering grants for local churches that are taking overseas international mission trips and are providing children's vacation Bible school children's programming in those communities. Many churches have asked about grants for camp in the community, which we all know is another vital ministry of this uh, conference. Each year we offer a block grant to camp in the community so that they can administer and use to provide financial support to those host churches in this conference. Uh, and we feel like they are making those best decisions than the children's ministry team in determining who awards those. But we have been delighted to support camp in the community, as well as during the pandemic, camp is where the heart is. We will be receiving the Change for Children offering this year on Tuesday, June the 7th. We will be outside early as you come to the session on that uh, Tuesday morning. We will have buckets outside and you can drop your change in the bucket. You can 
bring your checks from your church and drop in the offering uh, buckets, but we will be delighted to receive your offerings as we continue this vital ministry in Holston Conference. We are grateful for your offerings. We're grateful for the change that you raise for children. And we are grateful for the churches that provide valuable ministries to children and families, not only in their congregations, but in their communities. So we collect change here at Green Meadow and at the back of the sanctuary, there is an old pitcher with bowl, and people throughout the year drop their change in there, and then we take a check, not all the change, but we take a check to conference with us. Um, so we'll, that's one of the checks that we'll be taking this year with us to conference. Please stand as we sing from number 577, God of Grace and God of the Lord. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. 
When you take away their bread, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. We stand as we sing hymn number 393, Spirit of the Living God. blood 
before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. As I prepare to head again to annual conference in a few hours, I can't help but think of the explosive year in 2016, whose rumbles began in the various annual conferences around the world that led to the explosive general conference that met later that year. Watching the 216, 2016 general conference online was painful as brothers and sisters of a church with a rich tradition struggled to remain civil over the matter of human sexuality and the church. No decisions were made that year. Instead, a special task force was called and the vote delayed to 2019. After that general conference, 2016, in preparation for the special called General Conference, thoughtful writers from various quarters called for a new denomination or a regional approach to doing church in an attempt to move forward. Others declared the effort to be global had no chance of success. However, what many had hoped would help us to move forward together as United Methodists failed at the special call General Conference. And the ripple effects continue to be felt in our denomination to this day. However, Christian unity can't and doesn't mean absolute uniformity. A church that divides itself into ever smaller groups around single issues pushes out the spirit behind Pentecost. Because of those who favor a schism and a division as a good or acceptable thing, fail to realize that if all church is regional, then it can be argued that all church is local. If all churches are local, there is ultimately no argument against radical individualism. All this goes against what was behind the new way ushered in by the Spirit on Pentecost. The Reverend Dr. Frederick W. Schmidt of Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary answers the question of how we got to this point by stating four things in an article written after the 2016 General Conference. He states, First, the elevation of one position on a single issue to the exclusion of any careful listening for the voice of God. Second, is the absence of a sound ecclesiology. In this instance, the tendency to think of the church as a churchy version of a global corporation. The third, is the passion for legislating everything on a national or international basis without allowing pastoral space to care for people individually and not just as a category of human being. And last, he says that this all comes from a misreading of the Pentecost story itself. So this morning, let's take a closer look at the story. Today's text startles us with a scene of almost unimaginable liveliness verging on chaos. As the eleven worshipped, there was a noise so loud that it could not be ignored. Their sensory systems were flooded with adrenaline. The sound, energy, and feeling were coming of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised. All of the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not one of them was excluded. God chose to send the Holy Spirit at the peak season when large numbers of international visitors were in Jerusalem. Many were practicing Jews who came from 
distant places all over the world. The individuals who watched could not rationally explain what was taking place. It was absurd to hear 11 people from Galilee speaking the local dialects of Asia Minor, Egypt, Libya, Rome, and other cities. Visitors to Jerusalem who listened in their language spoken were hearing about the mighty miracles of God and Jesus Christ. Some mocked the eleven. There was no plausible explanation for what happened. So it made sense that a few people found relief by saying that the disciples were drunk. Such talk provided comic relief in making fun of their strange behavior. But Peter came forward to speak to the crowd. By drawing upon the Jewish prophetic tradition, Peter showed that he too was a Jew. He knew the foundational text and called on the name of one of their ancestors, the prophet Joel. Peter was calling upon Jewish history so people in the crowd could identify with rather than discount him. Peter told the crowd that Joel spoke about that very moment occurring more than three centuries ago. The words of Joel that Peter spoke were words of prophecy. The Spirit will come upon all of Christ's servants. No one is excluded. Peter connects it directly with the promise of Joel that God would pour out his Spirit in a new way. <coughs> Up to this moment, God has acted by His Spirit among His people, but it has always been an inspiring person here, one or two there, kings and prophets and priests and righteous men and women. Now, in a sudden burst of fresh divine energy released through the death and resurrection of Jesus, God's Spirit has been poured out upon many people all at once. There is no discrimination between slaves and free, men and women, young and old. Freedom will come for all who serve. Liberation and salvation are available for all disciples. Peter's claim now is that Joel's words mean disciples of Jesus include all who believe in Christ. All those who believed that day that Jesus was the Christ joined this new movement. Many point to this moment in biblical history as when the church was birthed. What we can say about Pentecost is that it represents the inbreaking of God's purposes for all humanity bringing humanity together in understanding, despite their differences. Pentecost tells us the good news that our humanity, ruined and distorted in our distrust, has been restored in Jesus Christ. The spirit that animated Jesus' life, that united him to God the Father and empowered him to be fully the human image of God, is now shared with us. Thus, the cacophony of voices heard on that Pentecost becomes a chorus of praise. Babel becomes communication, and community is fashioned out of potential adversaries. What had once scattered generations of God's people is finally recovered in the pages of the Acts of the Apostles. Peter's sermon reminds us of the promise of God, prophesied, envisioned, dreamed of, and longed for from long ages past. The Spirit, the living presence of the eternal God, will now pour down upon all humanity, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved whatever language they may use, by whatever names they are called. 
Peter conjures up Joel's vision of heavenly signs and earthly wonders. The sun turned to darkness and moon to blood, signs of the coming Lord's great and glorious day. Peter will soon tell this crowd that that day has already dawned in Jesus Christ, the same Christ whose spirit blows through the house in which they are standing, whose fiery love created a community where only strangers stood before. Perhaps we should also remember why the author of Acts thought this story symbolic. If Luke took pains to argue that the church's redemptive work reached across the endless division in a world that he knew to be divided, then perhaps we should hold out hope for a world we casually assumed would see the gospel in the same way as we do, but doesn't. Although I do not know the outcome for the United Methodist Church in the days or weeks ahead, I know that God is with us here and now and will use even this present moment of chaos for God's purposes. I realize that people on both sides of the church's difference will be unhappy with unanswered questions and unaddressed needs, no matter how the pieces fall. But insisting on unity on our terms is not an antidote to our reluctance to live in the bewilderment that always follows the work of the Holy Spirit. Instead of the certainty we long for, Maybe what we need instead is a willingness to live in humility, acknowledging our limited ability to understand the will of God and a desire to remember that others need our patience as they attempt to understand the will of God in their own imperfect fashion. We need a recognition that the kingdom's work is begun and advanced in this world, but is never complete. We need to realize that the work of God is advanced on multiple fronts in our lives and our world. The advance of that work is always fragmentary and incomplete, hence the deep conviction that church as the body of Christ is both the instrument of God's redemptive work and our redemptive destiny. Therefore, we need the courage to work for what we understand the will of God to be, without living as if we are the sole judges of what constitutes the will of God. The expectation that God's kingdom will come in all its fullness will sustain our efforts in the present and give us hope for the future. To those gathered in a room on that first Pentecost and to us here today, Peter announces the inauguration of a new age, a transition marked by a mighty wind, by tongues of fire, and most importantly by the gift of the Spirit. Peter promises that the Spirit will provide gifts of prophecy, dreams, and visions for all people. Though he does not describe the nature of the prophet, prophetic message, surely the Spirit will inspire dreams that align with the ministry of Jesus and visions that reflect the possibility of a world in which God's love permeates every human interaction. Prophetic dreams and visions are not future gifts. They are gifts for the here and now. Not a once and for all event in a room in Jerusalem. The Spirit comes again to the community in every age, inspiring visions that propose how God can transform 
current realities through us. They do not project some distant reality. Dreams and visions are exercising in truth-telling. They name where relationships and institutions fall short of the example of Jesus. And they call us to new fidelity to the gospel of love. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the wonder that erupted on the day of Pentecost, for the birth of the church, for the gifts of amazement and challenge for all the witnesses whose lives have been altered by your power alive in our world. For the many peoples of this earth whose visions differ, whose languages offer special insights, whose ways of worship and compassion, compassion feed our own, we thank you. For the earth itself, through whose creatures we see your love, and in whose winds we remember the coming of the Spirit, we thank you. Make us grateful for the confounding experiences the Holy Spirit's presence creates in our lives, for the marvel of new visions, for the wisdom in prophetic words, and for the prayers of your great high priest. Make us hungry to protect the health and nurturance of all people. Let your fire burn in the leaders of the nations, in governors and mayors, on city councils and school boards. Guard the lives of peacemakers, soldiers, philosophers, and artists. <coughs> Fool these skills and passion of all your people for the sake of our delight and the nourishment of others. Give comfort to all people who are refugees from war and famine, those who are lonely and frightened, ill, imprisoned, homeless or without work, and those who face death today. Knowing it is your Holy Spirit who has flowed through your witnesses of ages past, we give you thanks for all the saints who have gone before us, with them and with confidence that you hear our prayers. We commend all for whom we lift our voices, trusting that you give more than we need. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let's prepare our hearts for communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's <coughs> love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Change for Children is one offering we bring with us to conference. The other special offering we bring to conference will go this year to the South Sudan Ministries. Greetings, Holston Conference. I'm Mike Sluter. I serve as Director of Connection Ministries for Holston Conference. I wanted to take a moment to share with you what the annual conference mission offering is going to be for this year, 2022. This year at annual conference, we'll be taking up our mission offering for our brothers and sisters in South Sudan and for the ministries that we as a conference have had ongoing there since 2006. We want to continue to support them in, in many, many different ways. In 2016, you know that they had to flee South Sudan into northern Uganda and are now living in Arua, Uganda 
We are continuing to support our brothers and sisters there in the ministries. We've now got 19 churches in the refugee camps. Um, we have been supporting them with educational funds and with leadership development funds and have done some amazing work with our brothers and sisters there. In fact, the, one of the greatest pieces of news, I think, is that one of our pastors, Faustino, who was ordained an elder uh, about three years ago, is whenever they get to have annual conference, Bishop Wanda is going to name him as the district superintendent of the South Sudan district. Fred Deering will step down as that role of district superintendent, and Faustino will step into it. We have been working for indigenous leadership for a long time, and Faustino is going to do an excellent job. That's because of your support. We want to continue to be able to support through educational funds and leadership development funds. And so our annual conference mission offering this year will be going directly for that. We thank you so much for all the ways that over the years you have supported our brothers and sisters in South Sudan, and we want to continue to be in ministry with them as they continue to lead the church there in South Sudan. So I look forward to seeing you at annual conference and to being able to celebrate and to worship together. Uh, the annual conference mission offering will be collected at the mission celebration. So we will, that evening of worship, we'll be collecting that offering and we'll be getting it put to use as quickly as we can. For the mission offering, we ask that you would Choose a Sunday, your choice, a Sunday in May that works best for you and your church and collect the offering for the mission offering for annual conference and then bring it with you to Lake Tune, Alaska and we'll be collecting them there. So thank you once again for all of your support and may God continue to bless you as you bless others. So if you wish to give a check today, uh, in the memo, the right um, special offering. Because God first loved us, we are made to love one another. For the sake of the life of the world, offer yourselves, your time, your possessions, as signs of love. The usher, please come. Let us bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Please take these gifts that you have given to us that we now give back to you and bless them for the building of your kingdom. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
holy is your child, Jesus, who sent the Holy Spirit to be with us so that we would not be left alone. On the night in which he gave himself up, Jesus took the bread, broke it, saying, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the healing of the world. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of grain and grape, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ, filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit for the healing of the world, sender of dreams, spirit of truth, giver of visions. You are the one God to whom we offer our praise and thanks. Amen. And now as one community, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is not a United Methodist table. All are welcome to come and receive the elements. You will be given two cups. The bottom cup contains the bread, and the top cup with the lid contains the juice. If you are gluten intolerant, the prepackaged have rice wafers instead of wheat. If you will come down the center aisle and return by the side aisle, and we will begin with the people on our left first. Please come.
join me in our closing prayer. Make us thankful every day, O oh God, for the gifts that alight upon us from your bounty. Guide us to use these offerings to your glory for the health of your people and this creation. Amen. Please stand to sing the closing hymn, number 539, O Spirit of the Living God.